I'm Laura London, and this is a special live stream edition of Speaking of Jung. Joining us today for episode 115 is Jungian analyst Marianne Meister in Zurich, Switzerland. She holds a degree in German language and literature, philosophy and art history from the University of Zurich, where she later went on to earn her doctorate. Her dissertation was on the subject of children's language and relationship behavior. She later received two additional degrees from the University of Zurich, one in clinical psychology and the other in psychopathology of adults. Dr. Meister trained as a Jungian analyst at the C.G. Jung Institute Zurich, graduating with a diploma in analytical psychology, which is the degree of a Jungian analyst, in 2002. She received supervision training at the Swiss Society for Analytical Psychology and at the Jung Institute, and further training in process and embodiment-focused psychology, known as PEP, with Michael Bone. Dr. Meister is a psychotherapist qualified by the Association of Swiss Psychotherapists, a specialist psychologist qualified by the Federation of Swiss Psychotherapists, and a psychoanalyst for adults, children, and young people qualified by the C.G. Jung Institute Zurich in Kusnacht. She is also trained in Dora Kalft's Method of Sample Therapy and is a training analyst, teacher, and supervisor for sample, qualified by both the Swiss and international societies for sample therapy. From 2010 to 2017, Dr. Meister served as president of the Ethics Commission of the Association of Swiss Psychotherapists. For eight years, she served as vice president of the Jung Institute's curatorium, and as head of their Further Training and Vocational Policy Committee. Currently, she works as a lecturer and a training and supervising analyst at the Jung Institute and has a private practice in Zurich, Switzerland. She is the author of The Key to the Self, Understanding Yourself Through Depth Psychological Astrology, originally published in German by Patmos in 2015, and just this year was published in English by Chiron. She also contributed the chapter C.G. Jung, Individuation and Painting the Unconscious in the 2020 book Breakfast at Kusnacht, Conversations on C.G. Jung and Beyond, edited by Jungian analyst Stefano Carpani. Please visit our website, speakingofjung.com, for links to everything discussed in this episode. This interview is being live streamed on Friday, October 28th, 2022, through the magic of StreamYard. Thank you so much for joining us today, Dr. Meister. You're welcome. It's good to see you. Yeah. Thank you. So I would uh, first like to say a word about this podcast mm -hmm. and how it kind of differs from the online courses and seminars and webinars. This isn't a lecture. This is about the analyst, uh, just as much as it is about the material. So I'd like to start by going uh, over a bit of your background. Um, I mentioned that you trained in PEP with Dr. Michael Bone. Would you tell us a little bit about PEP, EFT, TFT, let's see, EDXTM, knock therapy and knocking technique? Ah, so, ah, uh, yeah. P this is a very interesting technique. Uh, Dr. Bone, Nick Michael Bone, made also his psychiatrist and Jungian, he made a Jungian analysis. But he is very impatient, as he says, from about himself. Yeah. He wanted to have a quick method. And this is why he developed this uh, PEP, as we say, PEP. Method, which is based um, um, substantially on the Chinese uh, traditional acupuncture points, okay. acupressure points, yeah. and it's very useful if uh, a patient come into the practice with a big anxiety, 
mm. uh, disorder or with a panic attack, then you can take it, bring him down to earth very quickly by this by this knocking method. Mm -hmm. And is that available everywhere? I mean, where do you practice that in your practice? Uh, very seldom. Okay. I, not very seldom, but uh, yeah, not every day. Okay. I, I would say the main the main things I do is dream work and yeah. self play and these kinds of things, painting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you graduated from the Jung Institute, as I mentioned, um, and before that, uh, before you trained there, you received some degrees, a few degrees actually, at the University of Zurich. So I'd like for you to share with us what led up to you deciding to train as a Jungian analyst? Were you practicing as a psychologist first? No, no. I my decision came with seventeen already. In fact, uh, with seventeen, I met a Jungian analyst uh, who gave a, a talk about uh, pedagogic, the Jungian, the Jungian dealing with uh, people, with young people, and I was uh, in the high school there and was interested, although mm -hmm. it was for teachers and parents. But I went as the only pupil, and um, so I asked him if I can learn more about this stuff, because I was very interested in Jung immediately. And he said, yeah, the best is to make an analysis. Yeah. And this I did. I went mm -hmm. every three and once a week, every free uh, Wednesday to mm. him, yeah, and made my first analysis and then decided with 18, so I did it for a year, uh, that I want to become a Jungian analyst later when I'm more mature. Okay, so when you said 17, you meant when you were 17 years old? Yeah, when I was ah. 17. When I was very young, Okay, I started with... I also read then already Jung and Freud, and I already had made my decision. I prefer Jung mm -hmm. uh, because he's very creative and more open. Yeah. So I decided then uh, to become a Jungian analyst when the time is the right time. When is the right time? Yeah. Yeah. So you worked as a teacher. Yeah, yeah. Well, you were. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, tell us. Please T tell us. You were you were a school teacher for many years. Uh, not so many years. Not so many. Because I was studying. I was some years uh, a teacher. First, a primary school teacher. This I did for a year because I wanted to study, and then so I was very young. I was twenty. Ah. From 20. And then I studied my first studies, literature, uh, philosophy, and art, mm -hmm. and then became a high school teacher and worked as a high school teacher and made also theater with the children. And um, so, mm. yeah, mm -hmm. so, uh, uh, so for some years and made my thesis, wrote my thesis. Mm -hmm. My doc doctorate. You got your doctorate from the University of Zurich. But yeah. the entire time you had in mind to train as a Jungian analyst. Yeah, I always had in mind when uh, the right time comes, I will train as a Jungian analyst. And then, yeah, the right time came in because I have also a private life. Yep. I developed a family and then a second family and so, and then the right time had come. So that's what you meant. Cause I could just hear the listeners wondering, well, what does she mean by the right time? How do you know it's the right time? So it had to do with, with your life and, and what else was happening in your life? Yeah. And my uh, very, my very early interest and decision already with 18 Mm. to become a Jungian analyst. And then I did 
a lot of things in meantime uh, very engaged but I never forgot my real aim because I always was very interested in uh, uh, relationships which is only between you me and another person and when I was a teacher when I was working as a teacher I was very sensitive for the problems of these young people yeah but I uh, couldn't help them profoundly Mm -hmm. And so now the time has come to become an analyst so that I can more in a deeper way help them. Mm -hmm. Well, tell us a little bit about that, because uh, when I first started reading Jung and when I was in analysis, I had always heard that Jung's psychology was the psychology of midlife. But then when I had uh, Robert Tyminski on the podcast from the Jung Institute in San Francisco, he talked about being trained in child and adolescent uh, analysis. And yeah. you are as well. And so would you tell us a little bit about just how Jung psychology um, is not necessarily uh, meant for people at midlife? No, not at all. Okay, tell us about that. This is very important, but uh, it's a very rewarding work uh, to to work already with young people, especially with children, because they are very open. And yeah. when they have a, a problem, and I make play therapy with them, and or they very often play in the sand also that this they do alone, of course, but I play with them together, other other games. And um, they make a very, um, yeah, it is very surprising very often how quickly they develop and um, can um, overcome very, very hard problems. Mostly the teachers come with, uh, and, and recommend to the parents the child needs a therapy because it's um, very intelligent but can't, can't make the performance. And then the school psychologist usually uh, finds out that there is an emotional problem. Yeah. And then I am um, recommended. And so I start to work and it's very rewarding also to work with the parents to take them as um, support. So I explain them that they are the most important people for the child. So they, we need to work together. And usually this works very well. And so we can help the child to develop and yeah. Yeah. So when you say play therapy, what is that exactly? Play therapy? Yeah. This um, means that in a playful way, um, the I, I deal with the child. Mm -hmm. uh, the children usually, most of the children don't come and talk like adults. Okay. They come and immediately start to go into the sand and say, oh, mm. that's interesting. And so are looking around and are starting to do something if they are not very shy and only standing there and looking everything watching what do i find here and uh, so what the the, pr the main principle for every kind of play or game i do with the child is that we can connect to the unconscious mm -hmm. so the child as well as the adult connects in therapy with the personal unconscious and the collective unconscious and you can see this then in the sand play mm. and see this in the paintings and some of the children even have dreams and can remember them and there you can see the same you can see the same like in the dreams of adults mm -hmm. And we're going to get to your book in a minute, but just to finish on this point, you mentioned working with the parents and I'm, I'm not a parent. So 
yeah. listeners, please forgive me. Okay. I know you're not going to like this, but, uh, with dog training, Caesar Milan, for instance, works with the, the, the dog owner. And because usually behavioral issues with dogs are about the owner. Yes. And this okay. is the children. The same with the children. Okay. Yeah, the, the child, you, so there are two factors. One is that the child is a symptom bearer of the, of problems of the parents. The child is the symptom bearer of the yeah. problem of the parents. Yes. Very often or of the whole family. Uh, the, the child who, who is most sensitive uh, shows the problem, and uh, and other siblings, for example, don't show any problems, but the most sensitive child shows a certain problem. This is one thing, and the other is a typological factor. Uh, when the mother and the child don't fit together typologically, yeah. Yeah. then it is very, very hard also for the mother. Uh, when, for example, the mother is extremely extroverted. I had just uh, such a child uh, who could finish the therapy with a very extroverted uh, and a, a career woman, a very uh, intelligent and, um, and competent woman, but she was extremely extroverted while the child was very strongly introverted and on the other hand the only planets which are on the top of the chart are very open so she couldn't put boundaries uh, and the mother liked always to have a full house in, mm. at the weekends every mm. weekend was full house with other people while the child with his sensitivity and introversion needs, introverted needs, uh, wanted to be alone or only with the family and have time and the own space. And uh, because the mother wasn't aware of this, the child became suicidal. Mm. Yeah. Uh, what do you do? Yeah. We could fix it. We could fix it. It needed a long time. Uh, the child had also a lot of psychosomatic disorders, mm -hmm. which has not gone now. Now she is very healthy in her body. She got a really good connection to her body, is also making acrobatic mm -hmm. and these kinds of things. And uh, but she is in a private school where is a, a small class for uh, taking into consideration her um high sensitivity and the mother tried very strongly to adapt to the needs mm -hmm. of the child so the mother does her best and she was very relieved when she knew that there is a typological problem because she had very strongly guilty feeling and had the feeling i'm a bad mother and so right. yeah. and i would help her to get a relief by seeing that she functions totally differently. Mm -hmm. She has other needs as an extrovert. Uh, she has another perspective onto the world and onto the child than the child has. And so I, we could talk about these things uh, many times. And so she could change her behavior towards the child. Mm -hmm. And, and in this way, also support the therapy. Mm -hmm. That's so interesting uh, that that typology can be um, such a factor in yeah. not, not, I just think of it so much in getting along with other people and not so much in getting along with our parents or our siblings. And mm -hmm. so we're going to get into typology when we talk about your book, because you tie in astrology and typology in this book so well. So I um, wanted to ask you first, because I read your bio, but there was nothing about astrology in your bio. So are you an astrologer? 
oh, there is nothing in my bio, then uh, I must have forgotten it because it is for me so normal that I'm an astrologer. Mm -hmm. Uh, uh, I also started with 17 or uh, even with 16 with astrology when I was 16 years old. Okay. So I do it re really since a very long time because I found it always very interesting to see that I reacted differently to different classmates. Yeah. And that also they... Um, the different classmates to each other acted yeah. differently yeah. And, uh, and so on. And I became uh, interested and started with uh, astrology when I was 16. Because when you were 16. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Because you noticed that I, I did too. I, I studied astrology formally uh, back in the late 1990s and it, it saved my sanity because it made everything make sense to me when nothing did before. So yeah. did you have any formal education in astrology or are you self-taught? First, with uh, 16, I started together with a classmate. Mm -hmm. I engaged her that she also was interested. She's also interested. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then we started to draw uh, charts. Mm -hmm. To, uh, we, we made all charts by ourselves mm -hmm. and started with our own charts and then yep. with the families and so on. And then I had also formal, uh, the, I read a lot. I did a lot reading of reading of uh, um, the most uh, important uh, uh, names in, in, Ger in German. Mm -hmm. And but then also I started in uh, reading uh, English literature, for example, Rudyard. Oh yeah, Dane and, Rudyard. Yeah, yeah, and uh, especially I got then trainings about uh, Thomas Ring by an astrologer who was the assistant of Thomas Ring. Uh, who and I'm in fact uh, the the most important astrologer is Thomas Ring for me. For you. Mm -hmm. I had a lot, uh, several years private uh, um, um, uh, Unterricht, um, lessons, private lessons. Private with, lessons, okay. With this um, astrologer. Mm -hmm. Then I started to make my own courses. So I, I provided courses and I started to uh, provide uh, chart discussions very soon then. Mm -hmm. And did you use astrology in your practice with yeah. your patients? And I'm sure not every patient is open to something like that. No. 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 Uh, but Jung was, uh, Jung had a very positive attitude toward, psych uh, toward astrology and he considered it the older sister of psychology. Yeah. Yeah. So, and I got that from, I would like to mention that every year on the anniversary of Jung's death, which uh, was June 6th, 1961, there is the C.G. Jung Memorial Lecture. And yeah. you delivered that lecture this year. It was uh, at ISAP Zurich, which is yeah. the International School for Analytical Psychology in Zurich, which is another training institute there in Zurich. Mm -hmm. And your talk was titled Reflections on the Fruitful Connection Between Jung's Typology and Its Older Sister Astrology. Mm -hmm. uh, and I was... Um, courtesy of ISEP Zurich, I was uh, given a copy of that talk that you gave. And so I got to watch it on video. And, uh, and, and I heard you mention that. So I'd like for you to start by telling us um, how you made that connection, because you started to study astrology from a very early age, and yeah. you started reading Jung. And so yeah. when did you make the connection between the two? So it start, it, it, it um, happened very organically, because mm -hmm. I, I worked with both 
typologies and I detected very quickly that Jung's typology is based on the elements like uh, astrology. Yeah. But what I never could see before, so the four functions, uh, thinking, uh, feeling, intuition and sensation, they you find them also in astrology, but more differentiated. So in the, the 12 sun, sun signs, but more differentiated because uh, all of the these four functions of Jung or the four elements which are related to them uh, are uh, have three modes. Have three modes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, each of the elements has three modes and appears a bit in a different way. And so it's more differentiated than when you only say uh, fire, earth, water, um, and uh, air. Um, yeah, uh, air. Yeah, air. Uh, of course, this is can be both. Both uh, typologies are very useful, very useful, mm-hmm. because, but uh, you can make a differentiation, for example, a, a Cancer and uh, Scorpio and Pisces all mm-hmm. are belong to the water element, but they mm-hmm. are very different in their expression and in their functioning. Although all are water, respectively feeling. Mm-hmm. So yeah. you had this background in astrology before you trained as a Jungian analyst. So while you were training at the Jung Institute, were there at that time, were there any courses in astrology or was that brought in ever? No, but now you're teaching it, aren't you? Yeah, yeah. Uh, he- it was even like this that it was uh, that people didn't uh, certain people didn't like to see it that i bring the issue of astrology but after i wrote the book i dared to do it uh, only after that before i didn't and so yeah but i find it very mm-hmm. legitime legitime to bring them together and especially also the, with the two um, attitudes of Jung, introversion and extroversion, yes. you find these two attitudes also in the chart. And this was very interesting for me to uh, detect this because before I studied intensively Jung, I wasn't aware that I could also bring this together. And then mm. I, I uh, yeah. Very good. Very good. I applaud you. Mm -hmm. So do you met with some pushback at the Jung Institute for for bringing in astrology? And I find that surprising. I just want to mention for the listeners that are not aware, Jung used astrology in his own practice. His Mm -hmm. daughter, Gret Baumann, became an astrologer herself. And no, there's not much about astrology in Jung's collected works, but there's a lot. He mentions astrology, I would say, often through in the letters, in yeah. letters, volumes one and two. And mm-hmm. Liz Green, uh, I don't know if you know her, she brings yeah. that up. Yeah? Yeah, yeah. I also yeah. make courses uh, for this Liz Green. When I courses from Liz Green. Young, yeah, I went to her courses, yeah. So... She mentions that in her two volume series on Jung and astrology and the Red Book, which Mm -hmm. I'll provide links to the whole background of that in the show notes. We we won't get into it now, but um, I appreciate that you've brought it to the forefront and this book which, as I mentioned in the intro, uh, you published in 2015, but it was only available in German. Mm-hmm. And then this year, it was translated into English, and it was published by Chiron. It was released in July. We're going to be giving away a copy on Twitter uh, today, actually. Uh, today's the last day to enter, so there's still time. I'll stretch this out, so I'll 
I'll do the uh, the drawing, if you will. I use a random number generator to pick the winner. I'll do that tonight, uh, which will give people uh, more time to enter. So just go to my Twitter timeline. I am Jungi and Laura on Twitter and look for the tweet and uh, follow the instructions and we'll be giving away a copy of your book. So uh, let's get into what exactly is in the book. Um, you begin with a discussion of archetypes and the gods mm -hmm. and the planets specifically as archetypes. And I would like to mention before I let you uh, tell us, I would like to mention to the listeners that there are illustrations in this book and there are charts and there are, um, there are, keywords. And then at the end of the book, you use example charts, which are very helpful because you give examples of what you discuss earlier in the book. So let's start at the beginning with the images of the gods within us, the planets as archetypes. Yeah. So the planets, these are symbols of the most important archetypes which every person has to deal with this is for example the most important for most of the people is love uh, and so venus and mars are very important they deal with the love uh, uh, need for love which every person's ha person has and the most primary archetypes probably are sun and moon. Mm -hmm. We all have a mother. Uh, every human being has a need uh, to be mothered. We are, wouldn't be born without a mother and also without a father. Mm -hmm. We need both. So, And they are symbolized by sun and moon. Uh, but we could also talk about these archetypes without taking the astrology, uh, the astrological terms. We also could only could talk about mother principle or mother archetype and father archetype. Mm -hmm. So the planets represent the archetypes, and we all have the planets, every planet. Yeah. And you use Pluto as a planet. I do too. I know some people don't. In Hellenistic astrology, they don't use the outer planets. And I had a Hellenistic astrologer uh, in my quarantine series, S.J. Anderson. He's wonderful. And that is, I think, just as as valid and, and as interesting as, as um, traditional astrology. So we look at Jung's, you look at Jung, Jung's concept of the archetype. Mm -hmm. and how the planets symbolize them. And then you also talk about complexes and the mother and father complex are very important here as well. Yeah. Uh, so uh, I look first at the archetypal basis, uh, which is behind uh, of every complex. Uh, every complex is built on an archetype. Mm -hmm. And so the, 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 the aspects, the aspects between the planets is like a, a talk between the different gods on a very structural archetypal level. So this means it's in a way in an empty way and everything is possible um, in a certain way. And then through the environment, the concrete parents and other uh, uh, aspects or or influences in the uh, around the child, uh, the complexes are built. Mm. So the complexes built are built on uh, through the experiences on and, and the core of each complex is an archetype. Yeah. So on the archetypal structure uh, develops the complex structure. Okay. In, Art can can be uh, you can look at the chart like this on on both levels. 
And you also said something in that Jung uh, Memorial Lecture about um, Jung. Jung said astrology was invaluable for self knowledge. And yeah. yeah, and I, I mean, I just I can't emphasize this enough how much astrology has helped me not only understand myself, but understand the people around me. Why are people different? Why do people uh, communicate differently? I think that was the biggest thing for me is how people communicate differently. Look at the position of the planet Mercury in their chart. What sign is it in? What house is it in? What aspects does it make? Things like yeah. that. Yeah. So it's a very uh, something very complex. Uh, 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 and each person is very complex yes. and very unique. Yes. And uh, it helps really very much to recognize uh, ourselves and also uh, see that we, um, yeah, we, when we recognize ourselves through, through the chart and we know uh, it is, uh, um, uh, yeah, crucial that we try to develop all of our uh, aspects in the in the chart so all of our personality traits and not only that we not only lift those who are the most comfortable yeah because this is not possible to get a wholeness we need to lift the whole structure and for this we need to deal with the complexities yes built on the, on the archetypal structure and for this it's extremely helpful the chart as you're talking i'm just realizing more and more how jung's psychology sounds like astrology and how the two are so connected and how i wonder if jung was conscious uh when he was doing his writings, if he was conscious of um, astrology as he was writing and developing his theories, or if he was doing it unconsciously? Uh, honestly said, I don't know. Yeah, right. <laughs> no, you myself, right. so I ask him personally. Yeah, but I think, uh, so he was very interested and he wanted to deal more closely, but he didn't have the time to develop all aspects. Uh, I think he uh, tried to engage a woman. I think it was uh, uh, Mrs. Frey, Frey Ron, who... Oh, I yeah. Mean, it was Frey Ron, Mrs. Frey Ron, who... Lillian. To make certain researches in astrology. Yes. When I'm not wrong, <laughs> I have mm -hmm. to check later if it was really this woman but he tried to engage other people to deal more closely with mm -hmm. it mm -hmm. but yeah then he developed other issues more himself yeah and i'm glad he did i'm glad he did um i would like to move on to the second section of your book which is on typology and you go over the four elements and the 12 signs and the four functions and uh you know you you break that down and uh that's all laid out there in chapter two uh for the listeners who are interested and so you you went over that a little bit already so on to chapter three, which is titled Inside and Out, Two Psychological Orientations. Would you say a little bit more about extroversion and introversion? And uh, as far as if you're looking at the circle, the wheel, the horoscope, which is a circle, which is yeah. right, Jung's symbol uh, for the self. Yeah. So I am glad that you want to talk about these two terms because many people have a, a wrong understanding about introversion and extroversion. So I first want to say what how I understand Jung, that he makes it, uh, uh, he relates uh, the introversion and the extroversion attitude to the uh, 
relationship to the object. The, while the extroverted person is extremely uh, uh, interested in the outer world and in other objects, other objects are human beings. Yeah. Uh, and uh, in psychological terms. Uh, and while the introverted person is always um, the, 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 the main focus is on the subject and the, in the introverted person. And the introverted person feels quite often or very easily that the other objects, that other p people are bothering him or her or mm -hmm. disturbing him or her and um, so this is a, a big difference and uh, and it ha doesn't have to do anything with being shy mm -hmm. shy extroverted people you find shy introverted and the opposite and it doesn't also have to do anything with talking a lot or right nothing because you find uh, in extroverted and in introverted uh, human beings people who are talking a lot a lot or are talking a few so it does it, this is not the criterion the only criterion is um, if the person the subject is more related to himself mm -hmm. and what can I need from the other? And he uses the other object more in a way or um, can only respond to them when they bring him um, something which is interesting for, mm. for him. Uh, while the, the extroverted person is interested in many 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 things uh, that there is uh, sometimes the danger to lose himself or herself mm -hmm. in because there are so many interests everything is interesting nearly everything uh, the the extrovert the introverted person has can make much more easily boundaries mm -hmm. because the, he's he's more instinct related usually and the instincts are more conservative and are putting boundaries automatically in a certain mm -hmm. and they can better be with themselves it depends on the signs of course but in general generally spoken while the extroverted people are more dependent on the outer world because they need it to feel vivid and uh, and um, yeah uh, can uh, they need it also for their development much more than the introverted mm -hmm. and you can see this by looking at the birth chart and just for any of the listeners that are, are not familiar, really quickly, a birth chart is made using an individual's birth date and time and location. Those are the three essentials needed to determine not only the placement of the planets, the sun and the moon, but also the angles. And so the birth time is the only way to get those angles. And the angles are the ascendant, the descendant, the IC and the MC, which are very important points in a chart. So you can see, and you talk about this in the book, you can see extroversion and introversion in a chart. You yes. can see, also, um, which I could relate to, uh, and I'll use myself a, as an example, I have a very strong sensation function, because uh, you mentioned the four functions, thinking, feeling, intuition, and sensation. And I have a lot of earth in my chart. And earth and sensation are connected. And mm -hmm. I don't have a lot of fire, and fire is intuition. And I, I'm not, that's my inferior function. So it's all there. And the fact that some people have a problem with that uh, is doesn't take away from the fact that it, it, 
what, what do I want to say here? That it's, uh, it's factual. It's true. It's right there. What do you say to that? Uh, I didn't quite understand what, what's the question. What yeah, is just the that, mm -hmm. well, it, we'll use this as an example or as proof. Uh, when you cast a chart for an analysand, does it equate what you see in the chart to their typology? Yeah, I, I see the typology, but uh, I, I'm not quite sure if you want to ask if the, the, the elements are related to introversion, extroversion or not. When, because you mentioned your strong sensation function. And um, right, the four elements and the four functions. Yeah, yeah. And, and then the, the two hemispheres and introversion and extroversion. Yeah. The two but, attitudes. Yes. Uh, the two, but the two attitudes, I relate them to the, uh, the introverted function to the house one to six. And the extroverted function to house uh, seven to twelve. So it is not related to the elements. No, no, I didn't. No, I didn't mean that. I meant the hemispheres. So the two halves of the chart. Yeah, yeah, the hemisphere. Right. Yeah. Yes, the the uh, hemisphere below the uh, under the horizon. Yes. Ascendant and descendant, and then Imum Curly the midnight in the bottom yeah we call that the ic the cusp of the fourth house yeah the ic uh this i relate this to the introversion yes and the upper part which is to the mc really it, 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 the upper point is the mc is related to extroversion and this makes also sense because the introverted is when you define the houses, um, the first squ square has the first three houses, and this is the ego. Then the kind of how you were brought up. So it's the more body related mm -hmm. aspect and instinct related. Uh, the Taurus house, and then this is the second, and then the third is related to Gemini and related to the personal development. And then in the um, IC, after the IC, comes the fourth house, uh, and uh, which symbolizes family. Family, and uh, then the fifth house, uh, intimate love and close friends, intimate friends, and the sixth house, caring about everything which has to do with family, children, and so on. And the fifth house is also generating children and uh, making art. So it's a creative house. And all this is very much um, created, uh, uh, related to the person. It's very personal. The first square to the ego, the second square to the family, and everything is very strongly instinct related. And while uh, there is a turning point at the DC uh, with the Libra, usually, um, and th there it turns to the outer world. The libido is related to the outer world and develops more and more. Uh, it opens more and more. The seventh house is related to one person, then the eighth house to, the, to a group, the ninth house to the whole world, and the tenth uh, is even more related to the whole world, and the eleventh is the also the window to the world. It's very public. The, the MC is the public point, while mm -hmm. the e, e, um, IC is the private point. Mm -hmm. So my question was about um, when you are in your private practice and yeah. you have an analysand and 
you want some insight into the way we describe it is how you're wired. That's how I look at a birth chart is showing me how somebody is wired. And so you, my question was about you seeing their typology in their birth chart. Yeah. 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 It's so interesting. Uh, and then in the interest of time, I'm going to move on to the next chapter, if that's okay. Um, okay. Chapter four, which is titled Interacting Dispositions and the Influences of the Surrounding World, Aspect, Structure, and Complex Structure. Mm -hmm. So this is when you get into the aspect. So we all have all of the planets, as my analyst used to say, we all have it all. So we all have everything. Some yeah. is strong and some isn't. If a mm -hmm. planet is angular, it's strong and prominent. Yeah. If it's not, it isn't, right? So uh, you in this chapter, chapter four, you get into the aspects that the planets, planets make to each other. So tell us a little bit about aspects. So the aspects are, in a way, the style of the... the, the talk the gods have between each mm, other mm -hmm. so when you have uh, blue aspects uh, these are synthetic aspects this means they are very harmonious but it doesn't mean they are good or bad so it, the aspects are not uh, good or bad they are only harmonious or tensed uh, the red ones are uh, um, tensed aspects and um, and the green ones are something in between the mm -hmm. so-called longing aspects. Mm -hmm. So this means uh, when two planets, for example, I take the most simple sun and moon, the most important also, father and mother symbols, mm -hmm. or also mind and uh, feeling. Mm -hmm. uh, or conscious and unconscious. Yeah. When you are in a harmonious aspect, they work very well together. And the person usually, when she has a, um, a triangle or a six style, which are blue, uh, they have a quite a good self confidence because they don't have a conflict between mind uh, and uh, emotions. They they go easily together so, so and usually such people also have parents which have quite a good relationship or right. yeah while when the parents the symbols of the parents sun and moon are tensed for example in a square uh, such a person very often has parents who are quarreling uh, have a lot of misunderstandings, are fighting a lot. Uh, and the same when they, they have a polarity, when uh, yeah, they have difficulties to come together and to, to uh, have the same aims. They see most of the things differently and have always... Uh, a conflict with each other which uh, affects the child very strongly uh, because when parents are quarreling all the time the child becomes that doesn't feel safe in the world mm -hmm. the parents build the nest so and you can see this these these um uh, uh, this position you can see and then you can, uh, so I ask usually then more closely uh, how was the relationship between your parents, mm -hmm. how did your father behave towards your mother and your mother towards your father when there is a square or when there is an opposition. Then we have to discuss it more closely because this is the problem in a person. Right. Or when there is a longing aspect, so a green line, then the parents have always a longing to come together and uh, and uh, mm. 
need a life together, a good life, but they don't succeed really. It's a, it stays with belonging. Longing is defined as not get it, not reach it. Mm -hmm. Fado in Portugal is uh, in Lisbon. Fado, this kind of music, is very typical, a typical expression of this longing. Mm -hmm. So for the skeptics out there who are wondering, and there's even a part of me who wonders how this is possible, how can the day and time and location of my birth show the relationship of my parents? Because when I think about it, when you were just talking, I was thinking about the position of my son, the position of my moon, and I know that aspect, and I don't want to say it, and uh, the relationship that my parents had, it fits to a T. So as a Jungian analyst, as a reader of Jung, how do you explain how that's even possible? Is this synchronicity? Yeah, it is synchronicity. So we can't measure the the soul of a person, but we can measure uh, another on another level the planets, how they move, and this is something very exact. And astrology is not a, a logical kind of thinking. It is related to an analogical kind of thinking. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's a if-then relation. And when the, uh, certain planets are in a certain position, to each other in the heaven at the moment a child so this is the macrocosm mm -hmm. cosmos. and when a, a, a little microcosmos is born a little child it gets exactly this uh, um, uh, moment the, the moment of how the macrocosm cosmos is uh, characterized at the moment the child gets exactly this uh, moment um, this is very important for the child so it this is assu assumed since uh, astrology uh, exists because as soon as the child starts to breathe himself it breathe. is an own microcosm then it is an own microcosm which is a part of the macrocosm. And our task in life is to develop our microcosm, ourselves as a microcosm, as fully and whole as possible to um, uh, um, I forgot the word in <laughs> in English to um, give a relief to the macrocosm. A relief, I, to give a relief. Yeah, yeah, a relief or um, to perhaps later uh, I get the word. Okay. It's in my mind again. Okay. But we do a lot for the whole cosmos and yep. the cosmos each individual, when we try to live our uh, microcosmic structure as it is meant in this moment, when we are born, it is given the, only the structure. And when we want to, uh, uh, when we succeed to live the structure as constructively as possibly and as wholly as possibly, yes. Then we do something very good for, for the whole world, for the whole cosmos. And this is also, to me, an example of what Jung meant when he said that we were born with a certain blueprint, a certain template. Mm -hmm. And our job, should we be willing to take it, is to discover what that is and to live it. And yeah. so, again... It, to me, it, he was influenced by astrology because astrology is that blueprint. Yeah. Yeah. The, the chart. The chart. Yeah. 
So the final chapter in your book, chapter five, is titled Depth, Psychological Astrology and Self-Knowledge, Eight Horoscope Examples. Mm -hmm. And this is where you uh, provide the charts of individuals Mm -hmm. and discuss them. And yeah. they're very interesting, uh, and you you um, provide these color charts, which are great because you can refer to them in the book. Uh, so, would you like to say a little bit about that before we take questions from the live chat? And if you're in the if you're watching live and you have questions, please type them in the chat because I can see them, mm-hmm. and I'll read them all at the end. Yeah, some of these people uh, I knew only privately, and they were uh, ready to give their chart into my book, and others were patients. And um, I could really, the astrology gives, the, the chart gave them a certain overview over their personality structure and the, the, the issues in life mm-hmm. and uh, while the analytical work was then the the, the the this needs a lot of time and space while looking at the chart you have an immediate uh, overview over the yeah. whole personality yeah. and and I could use this. Um, uh, it, it was very helpful for my patients, uh, those who are in the char- uh, in, in the book, that I could tell them about their uh, problems. For example, uh, I want to check take one of these. Um, Yeah, for example, Charlotte, it's the seventh. Uh, she had always the conflict between uh, being highly sensitive uh, when she is in society and she, that she was very open. And on the other hand, she was very structured, but still is. And um, we can see there that she, for example, has venus in pisces at the end of the eighth house and this means she is extremely open towards the outer world and can't make boundaries she has big difficulties to make boundaries because she's very sensitive very empathic uh, and can and people can be very easily intrusive into her Mm -hmm. and on the other hand she has um the yeah no i i stay with this problem first okay so the the problem of making the right boundaries this was her main problem and she was very um uh, fight it uh, very much with uh, um um eating she was eating too much and she is very much overweight okay she, so she tried to help herself unconsciously to eat so much to to have a, a distance to people. Yeah. Yep. And the the planet which is responsible for making boundaries is is Saturn. Saturn mm-hmm. is the master in putting boundaries. This is the reality principle also. And this is very weakly positioned when you look at this chart. It is very weakly uh, positioned. It is not really included in the whole system. Only by uh, a half uh, square, it's a very weak aspect. And in a very um, far uh, wide conjunction with the moon. And so she has from her disposition a, a weak um yeah a very weak uh, 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 ability to make boundaries 
And so in analysis, we had to deal with this a lot. Making boundaries was the most important. It is number seven, Charlotte. Okay, in I'm, I'm going to try to share my screen. Uh, this could be a disaster. Uh, we'll soon find out. Uh -huh. So that yeah. uh, the listener or the people who are tuning in can see this. Uh, if I do this correctly, as you keep talking, I'm going to... Yeah. Try to show Charlotte's chart here. Yeah. So this Charlotte um, has, in one hand, is extremely sensitive. And sometimes she has also such an expression like an angel, mm -hmm. like something, somebody from heaven, not like a human being. Then you can really see this Venus in, in um, Pisces. On the other hand, she has a very strong sun uh, in areas uh, she has very strong uh, planets uh, male uh, aspects and is has a very strong intellect so her sun and Mar mercury make a very close conjunction in areas so this means her thinking is fiery this is intu intuition and so she has a lot of fire and is very quick, like Aries is. Aries is the most quick sign. Yep. And uh, uh, very quick in decisions and so on. While Pisces is feeling. So there she is very sensitive and vulnerable in her feelings. But uh, the mind is very strong and quick. And Mars she has in which is the other male um, uh, planet uh, in Gemini. Mm. And this is in a sixth style, so in harmony with Sun and Mercury. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, also with Uranus. And so she has a, a blue, a blue, uh, can you, you can't show You know, I'm sorry, uh, I can't because Chrome is so locked down, it doesn't have permission. Shall I? And it says that I would have to give it permission and then restart it, and I can't do that. But yeah, we can see that. Okay, uh, I must. Can uh, I do it? This? Yes, Charlotte is on the right. Is the chart on the right? That this? one. Yes, yeah. there we go. So you see this. Uh, I must. Uh, this is the. Yeah, this is the Venus I was talking about. Yep. Isis which is very, very sensitive, and the Saturn can't help her. You see, he's very poorly related to, to the, this is Saturn here, very poorly related to the whole system. Mm -hmm. so she has a big difficulty to make the right and quickly enough boundaries. So uh, with this, the, but she helps herself by a very quick mind, and yeah. she is extremely intelligent and extremely quick with Aries, Sun and Mercury, which is connected with Mars uh, here on the top. With a, the uh, sextal to Mars. Also very quick. Gemini is very quick in, in catching what happens, what is around and so. And she can act then very quickly. And on the other hand, Uranus, which is even much more quickly Uranus it's in in which uh, it's in lion and we say Leo lion yep Leo, Leo yeah and uh, and she has so this is a very strong aspect and this 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 part is very strongly extroverted but in her case you can also see that she has a lot of introversions. She, she is not one-sided. She has both. And she needs also a lot of time for herself. She is very active in the outer world and organizing a lot of things and so on. She likes it and is very good in it. But on the other hand, she is very uh, uh, strongly uh, needy for a private life mm, mm -hmm. she's she got is neptune a, on the ic there 
You can see this? Yes, yeah, she has Neptune on the IC. Yeah. Just a moment. Yeah, she is also very religious, <laughs> by the way. Ah, she is well, that's very, one manifestation very of it. Mm -hmm. This is one aspect of Neptune. Mm -hmm. And on the other hand, she is very, very, a very good singer, a very good mm -hmm. pianist. Mm -hmm. Although she's also an analyst in the meantime. She's also an analyst. So this is a great example of what an astrologer can see about an individual just by looking at their birth chart. And again, uh, not only is the date, most people know their birth date. I do know some people who don't uh, because they were born at home or someplace that didn't keep records, but most people know their birth date, but the time is also important too. So to get that birth time is crucial. And some birth certificates, some states here in the United States put the birth time on their birth certificate. I was born in New York state and my time of birth is on there and uh, the location. And uh, you can ask your mother, she was there. Uh, so if, and if yeah, you can't, can I mention something? Please. Many mothers, just because they were there and had a, 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 to struggle with the birth, they can't remember the time, but pretend that it was this or that time. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, because you are occupied with other things. You are fully in the body and you are not in the mind and, and ah. the time. Uh, this is more the father or other people, and usually it is uh, note. Uh, there is a notice in the birth, in the birth uh, certificate. Yes, yeah. Some states here in the United States don't include it. Oh. Uh, yeah. yeah. What about there in Switzerland? Yeah, it's in it's included. Oh, wonderful. Yeah. Yeah, but uh, if there it's not included, then it's nothing else possible than to ask the mother if she knows uh, for, from somebody else, because usually the mother can't remember. Yeah, and you won't get an exact time if it's not written down. It'll be an estimation, which can affect the angles and yeah. the degree of the moon, which is very important. Yeah, you need that moon, moon degree. And the most quick uh, point is the ascendant. Yeah. It changes every uh, each uh, two, two hours. But we can sometimes find out the ascendant. If, if the time By doing is very chart rectification. Uh, it, uh, it, it's a very good um, possibility to look at the person. How does she enter a new situation? Mm. How, how does she come into your room the first time, uh, then you can recognize if it's Pisces or Aries, then it's quite easy to see uh, mm. which one it is because it's so different. Mm -hmm. What do you think mine is? Your. I don't know. Uh, I think it's easy. Maybe it's not as obvious. I'm a Libra rising. You are Libra? Yeah, rising. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So the ascendant is Libra. Yeah. And I have a Taurus moon and a, no, sorry, a Taurus sun and a Gemini moon. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I wanted you to go over this so that the listeners who are not familiar with psychology or with astrology um, to see just what can be uh, learned with a birth chart. And yeah. I want to ask you, before I go to the live chat, I want to ask you, I know that you practice as a Jungian analyst, but do you practice just as an astrologer as well? Yeah, sometimes with certain people who have uh, conflicts in the relationship or a mother who has big conflicts with a child and they don't want to make an analysis, but want to have a, a discussion about uh, who am I, who is my child, or who am mm. I, my partner, what needs do we have to have a, a quick uh, eye on this, to have, and then we can, uh, it, it, it is, can be extremely helpful, and sometimes I do it only 
only a, a chart discussion to help people to deal in a better way with each other. Mm -hmm. to, to understand that the other doesn't um, uh, want to harm right. the, the, the partner yeah. by behaving uh, in a certain way. For example, when the introverted person dives away in a way, mm -hmm. uh, needs his own time, and the extroverted partner feels left left alone, for example, then it is it mm. is very important to to explain that it is not a, a, an evil uh, motivation. Right. <laughs> uh, but from the introverted, for example, who draws back and needs his own space and so, mm -hmm. uh, or a lack of interest, it is. He needs only his own space <laughs> and then comes again uh, and in, into the communication later. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So these kinds of things uh, you can explain uh, very nicely and this helps to improve relationships a lot. Yes. Without any analysis. Without any analysis. And this is so crucial to understanding people and relationships. And I can't imagine how a psychologist or a therapist, a counselor could operate without this. I, I just don't see how that's even possible. So I'm going to go to the live chat now. And I had somebody making comments earlier. I'm not sure that there are any questions here. Uh, what came first? This is from Michael Espinoza. He asks, what came first, the science and observation of heavenly bodies or the mythology of the god planets? I think uh, first was the mythology. The mythology. Because all, um, all over the world you find uh, creation myths and other it's myths. True. Yeah. You find this all over the world before astrology uh happened yeah 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 and then uh we have a question here from images psyche would you say that the use of astrology in analysis is more appreciated by specific psychological types of clients say by thinking types because astrology is rather analytical no i wouldn't say that there is any difference no all types are interested and or not interested. Right. <laughs> Type doesn't doesn't matter. No. Doesn't matter. Okay, well, if there are no other questions, I'm going to wrap this up. Again, uh, the name of your book is The Key to the Self, Understanding Yourself Through yeah. Depth Psychological Astrology. Thank you for holding that up. And I'm sorry that I can't share my screen. I'll get that fixed for the next for the next episode. And there it is. It's a beautiful book. Uh, it does have charts, uh, not just astrological charts, but charts of what uh, Dr. Meister is discussing as far as the signs, the planets, what they represent, the aspects. You even have a chart on orbs, and that's all explained in the book. Mm -hmm. It's really beautiful. And there will be a link. Uh, you can purchase the book on Amazon. It is available in hardcover, paperback, and Kindle. And again, we are giving away a copy today on Twitter. Tonight, go to twitter.com slash Jungian Laura and look for the giveaway tweet to enter. Uh, let's see. I think that's about it. Uh, one more thing you said, we'll, we'll leave the listeners with this. You said, when you don't know yourself, you behave unconsciously. Yeah, yeah. I love that. So yeah. And we get a lot of problems. Right. <laughs> we sure do. Yeah. So I'll let you have the final word if there's anything you wanted to add before I end the uh, show today. No, um, I don't have to add a lot. But I want to thank you very much for your um, very agreeable kind of um, leading the discussion. 
Thank you very much, Laura. Well, thank you for your time and for writing this book. I really appreciate the fact that you've put all of this together and you're sharing it with everybody because I think it's so important to tie in astrology, typology, and analytical psychology. It's very mm -hmm. important. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to stay with me while I read the outro, okay? Yeah. Please visit the website, speakingofyoung.com, for more information on everything that was discussed in this episode. There you will also find all of the previous episodes of this podcast, which are available to stream or to download for free. This podcast is also available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Amazon Music, and right here on YouTube. Immediately after this live stream ends, I will be live again on YouTube at youtube.com slash Laura for a post-game recap. I'm also going to be calling out all of the Jungian community and share my controversial thoughts on UAPs. So with special thanks to Chiron Publications, to ISAP Zurich, and to Melissa Werner, I am your host, Laura London, and you've been watching a very special live stream edition of Speaking of Jung. Bye, everybody.